Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Hashtag Leadership, What's On Your Mind? A series to help you and inspire you on your leadership journey. So this week we're talking to Phil Kelly. Hi Phil, how are you doing? Yeah, really good. Thanks Stu. How are you? Not too bad. So Phil, I used to work with Phil in the RAF and he's got a really inspirational story from when he left and it's somebody that I've been really inspired by in my leadership journey. So you should know the, the um, format by now. We've got 20 minutes to dig into Phil's leadership journey and then we're going to add value to yours. So Phil, we've got 20 minutes. I'll start the clock. So for those who don't know you, Phil, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your leadership journey. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Phil Kelly. I'm the managing director of an organization called Pro Noctis, which is um, a human performance specialist uh, training and consultancy company. We've been going for nearly seven years now. So we work across sort of different avenues regarding corporate projects internally. We do obviously a lot, a lot of online webinars at the minute, a lot of online training courses. And we're also elite sports coaches and executive coaches too. Um, leadership journey is a funny one, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people's leadership journey starts before they even realize it. Um, for me, my sporting background when I was younger, um, I was, I was tended to be the one that was, you know, the, the verbal one. I was the captain. I was, I was the one who was orchestrating things off the pitch that maybe, uh, complemented what the coach was trying to achieve. So in terms of, you know, on field an on field leader, if you like, I always sort of filled that part, but obviously as a youngster, 14, 16, 18, 19, you, you've probably, I certainly didn't, I didn't know what a leader was. It certainly wasn't sat down and defined to me that this is a leadership role I want you to take up. It was just something I naturally did. And a lot of that is obviously down to your upbringing, your experience, what you want to achieve, how driven you are, um, and also your role within the team. So, um, yeah, started from sports. Um, I then worked in many, many different avenues when, when my sporting career didn't quite work out. Um, and that was huge. That was a huge learning curve from uh, learning from different people I was working with, so different levels of managers, um, and leaders. And then uh, at the age of 23, I joined the military, uh, where obviously I, I met used to. And I spent 12 years in there, uh, working through education and development and personal training and a lot of training functions, um, including, you know, future proofing the leadership capability of the RAF, um, which set me up in a great foundation to, to be able to set up my own business. You know, it was, a, it was a natural place to be where I got to that point 12 years in, which is half of a career in the military, where I either committed to a full career um, and then leave at you know late forties, early fifties, or I decide to make a decision and, and go and be a little bit more proactive externally and use those skills elsewhere. Excellent. So, just tell us on um, what do you see? Because I, I did this in episode one about what my passion about that's where in the military I got my passion for leadership and development training, and um, purely accidentally through the adventure training medium, um, I didn't realise how much it was used. So. If you were to explain to somebody else about the value of leadership and development that's put on in the military, well, how would you explain that and how would you, how we delivered that? I think, I think it's easier to uh, provide the value in the military because the, the operational output, the operational requirement is pretty clear. You know, it's life or death. If you've got a poor, if you've got a poor leader or a poor manager or a poor communicator, whatever skill you want to talk about, I think the, the risk is, is quite obvious. You know, it's, it's a very, danger-driven organization, very danger-driven industry, but it's life or death. Now, there are some safety-critical organizations out there that can learn a lot from the military. I mean, I have done, and I've seen a lot of consultants going in from the military to talk about you know, risk management from a people perspective. And in that, you need definitely need highly effective leaders. Um, but it's not always that clear-cut for some organizations where the risk might be something different. So it might be a financial, it might be reputational. Um, it may be for, for COVID at the moment, it's future-proofing the organization and make sure you've got good talent retention. Um, so it's not easy, that clear cut, but it, I think you need to very, very quickly overlap your, your leadership capability with your risk management framework because they, they go hand in glove. You know, you can't have one without the other. The, the only way you can have a safety culture, a just culture within an organization where everybody's open and honest with one another in the right manner is by having highly effective leaders. Um, it's a bit like saying, well, look, you know, we want to drive business performance. We want to make no, more money here, but we don't really need leaders to do that. You know, there's a massive disjoint. And I think that leadership skills are really sort of coming to the fore over the last two or three months where, you know, COVID's hit, organizations have had to pivot really quickly. Uh, we've had to have effective communications. We've got to know team members better. We need to provide some emotional support. We need to provide some guidance and intent. And all these good things can only happen if you're sort of in tune with yourself as a leader and the type of leader you are. So I think it all depends on the organization. But for sure, you know, operational output, 
um, business output. It's all driven by leadership for sure. Yeah. So we know that there's lots of different um, arms to leadership. And just to quickly go back to your leadership journey, what are the um, challenges that you either have on a regular basis that are some of the shortfalls in your leadership or one of the, some of the challenges that you've had or you've been aware of in your journey? I think um, from, from a client facing perspective, I think the, the challenges I'm seeing across many organizations is the lack of investment in leadership development. And I think there's a legacy piece there. I think a lot of organizations, if you think about, um, I don't know, it could be a HR director, it could be a head of organization development. It might even be the, you know, the C-suite members. 20, 30 years ago, they probably went on a leadership course. And in those days, training was very, very, very different. It was almost a lecturer standing, presenting, this is how you do it, this is how you do it. And sometimes they were incredible. Um, and therefore, the leaders would look at their, you know, their week away and go, oh, I've got two or three things away, but it wasn't worth one. It certainly wasn't worth you know, two, three, five, 20 grand, whatever they spent. So I think that the sort of the, the training um, area, if you like, has probably been tarred by those leadership, and they're still seeing it through that lens. So when somebody goes with a business case to say, well, actually, let's put you on that course or whatever, and they're like, well, wow, I don't see it. We can do that internally. Where actually things have obviously evolved massively over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, a lot of the things I'm starting to work on with individuals and the challenges I see is um, just effective leadership. Some people don't see themselves as leaders, even though they're in a leadership role. So a lot of people are technically gifted, they're technically skilled, they've spent 10, 15, 20, 30 years in that field working on that specific role. Now all of a sudden they've been elevated, promoted, rewarded for all their hard work into a senior management or junior leadership role. And now the output has to be completely different where their comfort blanket and their natural role is actually to go back and work on the technical skills. And now it's not about the technical skills, it's about developing and educating the next generation to be able to enforce that um, ability to do the technical role even better. Because I think the times of single points of failure, as I would call it, from a personal perspective, from a human perspective, we can't have that within organizations now. We need to you know, share, share, share everything. And that's why online platforms, you know, whether it's SharePoint with Office 365 or Slack or whatever app you're using, is so vital for that effective communication, that effective development, and that effective journey. Um, and the last thing I touch on as well is, is something we're working on quite closely now and looking at is the leader as a coach. So it's, it's, it's a different type of communicating as a leader that you, know, you could have a five second, five minute, five hour conversation with somebody. But as a leader, you can adopt a coaching philosophy, a coaching, a coaching approach to um, engage, to um, drive that level of performance from the people around you. So from a C-suite perspective, we're seeing a lot of mistrust um, by looking at their peers, not all the time, but they're looking around the, you know, the boardroom and they're like, I'm not sure if they've got my back. I'm not sure about that person. Right, I'm isolated. I'm on my own. Bear in mind, people working at the top are quite isolated anyway, so they're on their own. It's lonely at the top is the term, isn't it? And it's true. And I think, you know, if you're going to have a different approach, like a leader as coach, I think rather than thinking that the people around the table are blockers or up against it, or maybe, you know, trying to fill their shoes, trying to kick their, their back legs out, if you like, they can start engaging in a different style of conversation. And as soon as you have a different style of conversation, you create the opportunity for different outcomes. Yeah, fantastic. Um, the, about that self-awareness and that all the coaching skills that come into that. Um, so I really want to pick your brains and, and pick up a subject, if you like, of something that I've really been interested in seeing on your journey and what you do now. So you work a lot in what I deem high performance, and that goes into sport. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in your high performance sport um, and then the transferable skills that can then be put across into the leadership in the corporate world. Yeah, and, and it's, a lot of it is the same. You know, the, the elite sports athletes and the sport teams that we work with are human beings. So, you know, we're a human performance company. So we just work on humans to drive their performance games. So it doesn't matter if you're going to go to an Olympic final, you know, a big rugby match, um, or you're going into that board meeting, or even if you're a first-time manager and you need to have an effective conversation with some of your team members, that's the equivalent of your Olympic final because you've never done it before. So we're talking about, you know, you talked about self-awareness. That's, 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 that's a huge tool. I firmly believe that everything starts with self-awareness because you've got to understand how you, how you reflect your behavior on other people. So if you're not understanding how you're behaving and the impact you have on others, it doesn't matter what else happens. I mean, and we've seen it time and time again, uh, Stu, especially in the military days where we had some draconian, you know, transactional style leaders where just, just do as I say, you know, or maybe not as I do. Um, you know, that, that's, 
that opens up that opportunity for double standards within leadership. And people need consistency. People need to know where they stand. Um, and athletes are exactly the same. If, if there's no clarity of purpose, if there's no obvious goals they're working towards, if there's no engagement, if there's no what I call strokes, you know, so some, some athletes need a stroke, and I mean just a pat on the back or a thumbs up. Some people don't need that. They're in, intrinsically motivated. They know when they've done a good job. Well, good leaders, good managers, good coaches know that. They'll, know, they'll start thinking, well, what, what makes this person tick? You know, what type of personality are they? So you've got your psychometric testing in there. But what do I do now? You know, so my natural style is to do this. So my natural style, if you like, as a leader, is a nurturing, um, developing person. I'm very much, that's why, I'm, that's why I got into the business. I like, like working with people. I love spending time with people. But that's not always the right approach for some people. Some people just need to be told. Mm. You know, so if I went in with a coaching approach with some of my athletes that just go, just tell me what you're seeing, you know, because I don't pick up on gestures. I don't, give, I don't pick up on hints and tips. Just tell me what I'm doing wrong and let me rectify it myself. That's all I need. So it's about using that right tool for the right job. Now, the difference, if you like, let's go the opposite way. The difference is that with sports, with the Olympics, it's a four-year cycle, and they've maybe got two or three races that last, you know, with some of our cyclists, the race lasts three or four minutes. You win or lose. That's it. You know, and through the training journey, it's you win or you learn. That's what, you know, all the way through. Win or learn. If you don't win, what can we do better? What was, what, what was different? What did we trial? Could we improve the kit? But then when you get to the Olympics, the main tournament, that's win or lose. There's, there's no learning there because you, there's no guarantee you're going to be there four years later on. So from a business perspective, it's exactly the same. And I've actually mapped that across with one of my executive teams where they were going for a big pitch for a big parent company. And we just prepared as if it was a World Cup final. Said, right, you're going, you're, they were going overseas as a team of seven. They were going over to, you know, positively influence other people, build trust, build rapport, educate them, inspire, all the things that we want from sort of parent organizations. And, and they prepared for it like they were. They, they trained for it, you know, psychologically. They sat down in a boardroom. We flushed out their slide decks. What's your key messages? What are you trying to say with that? Right, who's doing what, where, when? So when they got on the plane to fly overseas, they were aligned. They knew what was going on. And guess what? It went really well. But we don't always do that within a business context. There's a lot of stuff we can learn from a preparation perspective from sport. And I will say there's a lot of things sport can learn from businesses. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because it works both ways. Yeah, for sure. But it's people again, isn't it? And going back to what I said at the start, you know, um, an organization is nothing without its people, for sure. And I, I'm just predicting this over the next six or 12 months. The organizations, they've got the people at the forefront of their thoughts. So effective leaders within day one of COVID, that Monday night when we got locked down, would have picked the phone up to the staff and gone, how are you? How does this affect you? Can you work from home? What's your working hours going to change? Is your family okay? How can we help and support you? Not where is that task that was due to be done yesterday? It's not about the task at that point. It's the companies and the leaders that are at the foresight of going, this is about people now. Let's make sure the people feel invested in, feel okay and feel safe. Then we can start developing that moving forward because this is a longer journey. And I think organizations that probably went, full hammer you still need to have the same output you still need to hit your deadlines why aren't you working from home is not from you i knew it was good this was going to work out all the negative dialogue for some leaders and managers spit yeah. those organizations are going to struggle because people are going to remember the way they felt when they had first contact with their leaders during covid and they're the ones that are probably going to get up and leave because talented people won't stay around for long yeah it's that nurturing isn't it and it's amazing that impact that just one or two little things has on a, an, a, an organization and a team of people. So I just want to pick up on one thing. So time, one of the things when I sat down after 12 months of being out, I saw everything was busy being busy. And I coined that term quite a lot that there's no direction and focus in people. And that common thing about that slowing down to speed up. What do you see are the, some of the key things or the light bulb moments that you've had with clients or people or teams when they've had that kind of, well, now we've slowed down and actually stopped and then they've actually seen how impactful that has been. Have you got anything um, sort of story tell around that? Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the classic one, the first thing you have to do, you know, as a leader, as a consultant going into an organization is build awareness. So, and I mean in that in everything from building awareness of your presence, you know, why are we here as a consultancy, what we're trying to achieve, how can they play a part? So we look to build an engagement again um, because you can't have difficult conversations unless there's a rapport there, unless they've got your trust and they know you've got your back. Um, so moving that then into something, well, how are you going to have personal development plans? How are you can have personal goals and clear objectives for your staff? What you're basically saying to them, if you do that early on is you're not doing your job properly, sort your life out. And you can imagine human beings responding to that when somebody's really passionate, they've given 20, 30 years to the business and they're doing the best they possibly can. They don't really need to hear that. 
But if you said, well, look, you know, what are you struggling on? You know, what's the things that could be better? What, if you, what, what could you change that could change your whole picture? And more often than not, they know deep down that maybe they've neglected their staff. They haven't had that chance for that coffee or the catch up. Or I've noticed that, you know, one of my staff's, staff's a bit stressed. They've started coming in a little bit late, but I haven't had a chat with them yet. Time moves so quickly, especially in the world today where we're completely exposed to information 24 seven that if they said, well, I think I noticed that on my member staff two weeks ago, it was probably two months ago, you know, when they first identified it. So it's about what are you willing to change that will change the bigger picture. And I think having clear direction and clear intent, also that push versus pull communication. And what I mean by that is if you're not getting direction from your superiors, from your board level, go and get it. You know, and if they're not going to present, they go and ask them, well, look, this is what I think you need to do. This is what you did in the town hall. This is the clarification I got. Can I just check my understanding? This is what I interpret to be. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Great. Now I need to communicate that to my team because if they're doing anything on any day that's not aligned to that goal, then they're wasting time, money, and energy. So once you've got key principles, whether it's, you know, three mission intent, um, three, three measurable goals, whatever it needs to be, that's when you get aligned as an organization. And that's where you get your leadership brought into it because they can deliver on that. But from the board level being too busy to, you know, iron out their objectives all the way through the organization, the trickle down effect. That's why for us, the perfect client is someone that's going to get us in a board level and a C-suite so we can help them flush that out if they need to. Or what do they mean by that? Get HR involved in terms of the communication and then spread it through the organization because everybody needs that. Everybody needs that direction. You know, tell me, tell me which head, where we're going, what's the end goal? And let me use my professionalism to deliver that. Yeah, fantastic. So just to finish off the last couple of minutes now, um, if a business owner is listening to this and they're in the position of they're growing a small team, so we're going from like single figures to double figures, um, starting to have that experience of I've got a leadership responsibility here, whether they've realized it or not. What some give me like three things that they they could be doing or they should be doing to set the foundations because that's my big thing about helping people build those foundations because as we know uh, going to the consultancy going to the bigger corporates and um, if you get it right early on you're you're helping yourself out later on down the line so what sort of things would you tell somebody to to think about and put in place um, from a from a personal perspective then I'd, I'd highly encourage that leader to invest in their own personal development. Uh, I, I don't think there's a, there's, a, there's a lose to it. You know, there's only wins and only gains because I think even if you learn something that maybe you don't need yet, it might pay dividends later on down the line and you learn so much about yourself. And also while you learn by yourself, you learn more about more people, which means it goes on to the second thing, which is recruit well. Now, except you are going to make bad decisions within recruitment. It happens, you know, um, but there's so many steps we can put in place for that. So, you know, if you were to, to map out your avatar, who's, what's your perfect team look like? And they can't all look alike. You can only recruit um, outside of the mirror of yourself if you know yourself. So if I like a yes man, there's no point recruit, re recruiting a yes man because, you know, we see it in America now, let's be honest. If you stand up to Donald Trump, you get pushed out, don't you? I mean, yeah. we don't want to get a political on it. You know, if you, if you stand up to me, I'm going to let you go and I'm going to bring somebody else who's going to agree with my worldview. Growth doesn't happen that way. Development doesn't happen. Now, what does happen is it antagonizes people to, to sort, of, sort of get you back, if you like. So, so personal development is really important and also recruit well. But also understand you're going to make mistakes and be vulnerable with them. It's a huge attribute for effective leaders in the minute. You've got to be vulnerable. And sometimes you've got to say, I don't know, guys. This is the first time I've had a team together, you know, mid-20s, whatever, late 30s, whatever it is. This is the first time I've been in charge of a team. I've recruited you in. I want you to come and help and support me because that's what I'm going to do for you. And say what you're going to do and do what you said you were going to do. Yeah, that's really important. And um, you see that a lot. And that, that's there was there was two things the busy being busy and the people getting promoted or getting a business leadership responsibility and not having the tools or the development to actually be there it's like that throwing somebody in the leadership swimming pool or not giving them anything to hold on to um so what's the future look like for you what, what's the future looking like for you with well, the, like, the business? like where are you going yeah, like most organizations, you know, the past eight to 10 weeks, is we've, we've massively pivoted. So we're doing a lot more online, taking things virtually to the point where I think they're going to hugely complement what we do face to face. So there's be some value add for some of our clients. So from a process perspective and a structure and a foundation perspective, we've, we've never been stronger. Uh, and what's that, what that has bred within our team is that they're actually coming forward with more suggestions now. And we have got the time to do that. Um, so rather than being client facing, doing, you know, day long, day after day on the train, traveling around the country, consultancy work, we're now working that, well, we're utilizing the time, you know, we're utilizing the time. It's almost like we're seeing as very much 
granted in a personal perspective it's really challenging but from a business perspective we're seen as a bit of a gift um and and we're trying to utilize that time because like you like like you know Steve, it's not about what happens in life it's about how you respond that really matters and i'm already looking back over the last eight weeks and some of the some of our platforms our online stuff some of our webinars some of our clients is it's unrecognizable you know and because of that because we're pushing out some good stuff we pushed out a lot of free stuff as well to support our clients and whoever's in their vicinity so you know creating that value add and we're going to kick on regarding uh, doing loads more organiza- organizational development work the academy is going to kick on so we're going to get a lot more people coming in to, to, to come on our new courses like our brand new human performance practitioner course we're also going to create a human performance master practitioner course to take it a level further um, and also we've got projects kicking off. So we've got an executive leadership retreat. We've got um, a reset retreat where people are feeling a bit burned out and tired. They can come and work with us with a load of exciting specialists. Um, and also we're looking to, to do some activity-based resilience workshops, which were due to kick off in April, but obviously that was scuppered. But that will be doing loads of stuff like mountaineering, cold water immersion, all sorts of stuff where we're bringing specialists in to help and support us. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, that's our 20 minutes. I managed to stop the alarm quite soon. (laughs) I went quick. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed that. I'm going to be click um, adding Phil's links in to go and check him out and check out the business. So thank you again, Phil. Make sure you've um, subscribed to our YouTube channel and follow our on your podcast provider and see you all next week. Cheers again, Phil. Bye.